Hi, I'm Kate, Plastic Free Mermaid. Thanks for tuning in to this interview series with Helena Norberg Hodge. This first episode is a brief history of the world from a big picture activist. Enjoy. Hey, you guys. I'm Kate, Plastic Free Mermaid, and I'm here with Helena Norberg Hodge, alternative Nobel Peace Prize winning author and activist and director of Local Futures. Today we are entering into a five-part series, just hearing about the work that you're doing and, and a bit of your perspective on the world and the state of humanity. So can you give us an overview of, of your work and your journey? It's a journey that started in a dramatic way about 45 years ago when I ended up in a part of the world called Ladakh, which is actually Western Tibet, but it's a part of Tibet that belongs politically to India. And there I encountered a culture that had not been affected by the global economic system that has been transforming the whole planet for the last 500 years. Mm -hmm. And I had gone out originally to help make a film, but I became so fascinated. I was a linguist, so I stayed and I learned to speak the language fluently. And I ended up working there and my organization still works there. So I was living there for a good part of the year for about 20, 25 years. And so I ended up having a very intimate view of a culture that is still more in control of its own future, of people who are much more connected to nature and people who have a really deep community that so clearly was the source of joy that made these people the happiest people I'd ever encountered. I learned to speak the language fluently so I got to know them really, really well and I saw over the years how through economic growth, economic development, they were torn apart from each other, from themselves, from the land and pushed into an urban prison in a way that was causing this intense competition for jobs. There had never ever been unemployment. There had never been the sort of pollution that we know of. And I also have to say that people were so much better off than we could possibly imagine. Mm. Because I had traveled quite a lot. I had spent time with the Zapatistas in Mexico. I had been very interested in traditional culture, but I had never ever encountered traditional ways of living where people were not affected by this mm. colonial system. So it did give a very un unusual and a unique insight that I think is badly needed today. And it's badly needed today because without a baseline, without some understanding of where this system we live in now comes from and what it does, we're quite lost and I feel there is a clarity that can come out of understanding the contrast between essentially a nature-based, community-based way of life and a way of life that has been now supported for generations by supposedly cheap fossil fuels, including the plastic. Including the plastic. Uh, and what that system has done in terms of, as we know, you know, it separated us from nature. Mm -hmm. but I don't think we've recognized the extent to which it separated us from ourselves, mm -hmm. how it is linked to what my friend Ian McGilchrist is talking about, which is how our brains are in danger of becoming imbalanced because mm -hmm. we have overused the left side of the brain. And in the process, we're out of touch with our own bodies, with our own souls, with our own selves. Therefore, we also buy into a propaganda about how with progress and growth we're all happier and happier and better off and those poor people over there who have nothing. We are not actually being helped to understand mm -hmm. just how impoverished we are. What I see Because happening. we value money and things instead of joy and, and health. I don't even think that it's so much about people valuing money anymore. I think we have to understand that most people in this global industrializing, urbanizing economy where people are being pushed off the land as we speak, mm -hmm. where small towns are dying, medium-sized towns, even cities are dying as the amalgamation goes on into larger and larger conurbations. Mm -hmm. That urbanization that separates us so badly 
basically traps us into a fear of how are we going to make ends meet mm. and it's not so much that we value money it's mm. that we value we want to have a home we want to have some security we want to be sure we can buy food tomorrow mm. we want our children to have future so the response to this system is greed is mm. a neurotic clinging on to money More. it's a natural mm. response uh, I would say and I saw it happening out there you know I saw people who had never ever being greedy as we know it and I say you know I have to remind you that I did speak the language fluently and I lived with them for years and years for about half of every year mm -hmm. and uh, you know one story I often tell is that I was in this particularly beautiful village because this is also an unusual traditional culture in that because it was up on the Tibetan plateau it's very cold and so they had you know these large amazingly beautiful houses mm -hmm. And I never, ever heard anyone complain about feeling poor or backward. In fact, I was saying when I was in this beautiful village, I said to a young man from the village, can you show me the poorest house in your village? Because they were just so amazingly beautiful, these houses. And he thought, well, we don't have any poor houses. And the same young man I heard saying 10 years later to some tourists, oh, if you could only help us Ladakis, we're so poor. Now, you know, the process of that poverty was one particularly that was psychological. Right. And it was the illusion that in the West, we have everything that they had, but we also have amazing cars and we have the ability to fly around the world. And so by contrast, suddenly the Ladakis comparing themselves to something they didn't know, mm -hmm. that it appeared to be so amazingly wealthy they felt poor and underprivileged. So it's a, it's a long story. I better not go into the Ladakh story too much. And I'm going to try to do an overview. Mm. But I hope people would be interested in, in reading my book, Ancient Futures. I wrote the book when I'd been there for 16 years. Mm. So by that time, the really dramatic consequences of creating unemployment and creating with it this intense competition for mm. scarcity, it d led to these dividing lines that had never been there before. Mm. Buddhists and Muslims had lived peacefully side by side for 500 years. There had mm. never been group conflict, but after about a decade of this change, tensions arose, and roughly 15 years afterwards, bloodshed, where literally Buddhist grandmothers said to me, we have no choice, we have to eliminate the Muslims or they're going to eliminate us. Mm. And I worked in Bhutan in the 80s, and in Bhutan, which most people will have heard of, the same thing was playing out. And there it was between Hindus and Buddhists. So it's very important that we don't see this just as a question of mm -hmm. Islam being violent. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a violent system that is being imposed on us. It's a violent disruption from nature, from our inner connections, and from one another. And in this intense competition, we see the worst greed, the worst anger, and epidemics of depression, mm. anxiety. And we are now clear about the fact that a lot of that is connected to social isolation. And people feel cut off and right. lonely. I would argue that all the major crises we face today have either been created by this economic system mm. or exacerbated by it. What is the foundation of our economic system? Where did we go wrong? Fundamentally about the economy, one of the key elements here is just GDP. GDP is how our governments measure economic growth. And now remember, the 24-7 narrative is that growth is essential. And most people who are struggling to pay the mortgage are going to say, yes, yes, of course, we can't stop the economy. So what they don't realize is that this economic growth is actually making everybody poorer. Mm. And when I say everybody, I'm now talking even about people in giant corporations. The CEO of Exxon. Mm. Exxon wasn't big enough to survive. They had to merge with Mobile. And when they merged, there's one CEO job instead of two. So the poverty of everyone running around chasing their tail to allow for mega mergers, bigger and bigger, more and more global. That's what we need to really understand. Then the measurement of what we consider progress is literally simply a measure of commercialization. 
So if the water is so polluted, we have to buy it in bottles. Good for the economy. Mm -hmm. If you have cancer and need chemotherapy regularly, good for the economy. Both growing your own food and staying healthy is bad for GDP. Mm. Community is the worst thing for GDP. Because that means you and I might help one another without charging money. Very often we want to decommercialize where possible. Mm. And the way that we can do that is through localizing. Mm. What's healthy think, growth? Well, healthy growth, first of all, is thriving ecosystems yeah. that grow food that's plentiful, mm. that have a balance between clearings and forests, that, you know, where we grow the real economy is the mm. living earth on which we depend. And just that basic eco-literacy, mm. I call it eco-literacy for economic literacy and ecological literacy together. Mm. Unfortunately, that is extremely rare. And unfortunately, there are far too many real grassroots, um, passionate environmentalists who don't want to or think they can't think about the economy. And that's, I think, one of the big things we need to change. That's why I'm so glad that you're doing this too. You know, it's really, we need above all young, mm. beautiful women like you who have that connection and that passion mm. to be willing to look at the economic system. Mm. Over the years, I've got a real lesson in how the economy works. And it started when I saw suddenly butter arriving in the local economy, having been transported for 10 days, and that butter sold for half the price of local butter. Mm. You know, that sent me on a journey also around the world where I realized that this swap of identical products was going on literally worldwide. Mm. And one of the most extreme examples was not between a poor country, so-called, and an industrialized country, but between New Zealand and England. So New Zealand butter in Cornwall, where they have like the best butter imaginable, cost a third of the price of local butter. So what we have to recognize is that the economic system we have started with force. It literally started with enclosures, driving people off the land in England, pushing them into this Dickensian London, mm -hmm. where there were no social relations, they had no interdependence with each other, they were suddenly dependent on wealthy industrialized that needed the cheap labor for, among other things, the cheap cotton that they had got slaves growing for them in other parts of the world. So we have an economic system that started with very wealthy traders in Europe using force, using genocide as a way of getting this whole engine started. Now that engine today means that you know, on one side of the world, people can survive on $5 a day. And on the other side of the world, people need $100 a day to survive. And now and more and more, it's also emerging within countries that the rural people are left behind. And in the urban centers, the prices of, you know, of labor and of everything else are much, much higher. But this divisive system benefits the traders. Mm. And it benefits no local economies anywhere. Because if you can produce on the other side of the world, paying a dollar an hour, and then sell where people are earning a hundred or fifty dollars an hour, of course you're going to do very well. Mm. But on either side of the equation, both populations suffer. So fundamentally, this economic system we have is based on global trade. And over the years, more and more, that trade has become absolutely a religious fundamental center of economic growth and yet we don't hear very much about it we don't know that in order to keep promoting trade you have now secret negotiations that are right. they're sort of the secret out in the open but What's happening is not that countries are sitting around the table negotiating trade treaties. What's happening is that they're sitting around the table being pressured by giant monopolistic corporations mm. and banks to deregulate trade further and further. And that means the deregulation means that those businesses and banks that operate globally should not have any constraints of regulation. Now this happened mm. 
and oh, that it makes it harder uh, for the the local growers, the local economy, the fresh food that's growing right in our neighborhood yeah. from being affordable to us. Yeah, because of it, all this deregulation of the global trade. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm. So it creates completely unfair playing field. Mm. And what we also need to recognize is that not only are the global giants free of regulation, they are also not paying tax. Right. Now, in the meanwhile, everybody who operates as a business, tiny or even a national business, mm. that's within a national playing field, is not only very heavily regulated, but mm. squeezed more and more for taxes. Mm. So uh, another takeaway around, around the economy is that we need to be aware that our taxes are used to subsidize global monopolies that don't pay tax. And what we also have to understand is that in this process of supporting more and more global trade, governments are becoming poorer than corporations. So mm. there are corporations that are wealthier than whole nation states, and there is this pressure on government, which was particularly clear after 2008. 2008, if you remember, we had this major financial crisis, and we found out that in the financial industries, people were trading in mortgages mm. in, you know, with envelopes of names of people in places they had never even heard of, they had no idea who they were, but this gambling and playing in a casino with our lives mm. was going on in this global arena without any regulation. So after 2008, when there was such a scary crash, the message went out, which was very clear, we need to regulate the banks. The message that came back was, no, too big to regulate, can't do anything. Mm. So actually, the casino games that have layers upon layers of derivatives and hedge funds that most of us don't understand. It can sound a bit overwhelming. It mm. can sound a bit like, well, we can't change this. And so the and how are they? How did it get to this this point? How did it get to this point where we can't even, where the governments don't even have control over these gigantic corporations that they're not being held accountable by anyone, and that we just? I mean, I think that's where a lot of that hopelessness comes from. It's yeah. just like. What do we do? We can't even lobby our governments because the governments are being controlled by these corporations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very good point. And for us, it's so clear why we got this way because there were very, very few environmentally concerned people actually looking at what was going on globally. Mm. What I found is that the people who were looking at the global scene were generally the big banks and the McDonald's and mm. the Coca-Colas. They were going around the world, opening up markets, and then sitting around uh, the table with governments to negotiate trade treaties to give them more freedom to move in and out. Mm. So they would have the freedom to come in and sell things that were already produced locally. Mm. But because they were a giant monopoly in a very short time, they could destroy the local business. What are the solutions? Yeah, well, the major solutions are for us to build up a movement that consists not just of environmentalists, but where we bring in the social activists who are seriously concerned about this terrible widening gap between rich and poor, which, by the way, is in every single country. Mm. You won't find a country now where the gap between rich and poor isn't widening mm. rapidly and in an obscene way. So the social activists, environmental activists, and we must try to bring in the people who are feeling insecure in their livelihoods, insecure in their identities, mm. and who are voting in a very frightening direction. The message is that focusing on a shift in the economy is what will bring benefits across the board. Focusing on a shift in the economy is how we have to focus in order to regain democracy. We don't have democracy right now. Mm. And so we need a people's movement that demands this. Current representatives are put in place often through all through the election campaign talking about what we care about, whether it be the environment, jobs, whatever. And then when they're in power in the national government, suddenly, bye-bye, they don't seem to be listening to us mm. anymore. Why? Because they're suddenly in this day-to-day -day situation with, of course, huge lobbying, and then this ongoing process of treaties that has been the main vehicle to mm. make it worse 
dramatically worse, particularly mm. the last 30 years. We're no longer the highest bidder. We're not the ones in power, the constituency, because yeah. they're not depending on us to get elected. Now yeah. they've got these lobbies, yeah. these corporate lobbies that have all this money. It's far yeah. more persuasive. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And also what's key in all this is to be aware of what's happened to ideas. Mm. What's happened to the narrative? Who is funding the big picture? Mm. Who has actually changed on campuses at universities, mm. the departments away from field biology to genetic engineering? Mm. How has the focus shifted around even corporations? Like in economics, they used to, I remember even 20 years ago, they had you know books saying, oh, it used to be that people thought corporations were a problem. Now they understand that governments have got to work with them. Mm. So we've had this subtle, well-funded way of seeing the world through the lenses of corporations that as animals, as structures, have to keep growing and growing. Mm. Not because of evil people. The people in them, many of them are truly good people. Mm. Some are not so good, just like in small businesses. Mm. Some people greedy, some people less so. So it's not really about the human individual. It's about the structure of the corporation. Mm -hmm. And that structure has been allowed to gain more and more power. And of course, in academia, we're not clear enough about how bad it is. Mm -hmm. But I would say even less so in the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. The environmental movement has been affected by who has been funding the yeah. thinking and the ideas. And we now know, you know, that there have been many groups set up that were actually big industry, but calling themselves, you know, the lobby for pure air or whatever, mm, yeah. even though they were fossil fuel company. But oh yeah, we had a lot were, of those from big oil. Yeah. The bag, the ban, you know, yeah. it sounds like it's it's a anti-plastic bag campaign, but really it's funded by big oil. Yeah, mm. yeah. But really insidious too has been that the, um, the funding that has gone on Generally, we haven't been clearly documenting this in the movements. We've mm. not been understanding it. I would argue mainly because most activists have been relatively localized and not actually mm. able to see, particularly the big transition of shifting jobs to poor countries, what that meant in those poor countries, what it meant to drive people out of villages and smaller towns, in slave-like factories mm. producing our Nikes and our plastic toys. Uh, the toxicity, the lack of family, the lack mm. of social cohesion for them, you know. Mm. So we haven't been aware of that. And so therefore this whole shift into the hands of global corporations, the fact that emissions were going up mainly because of their behavior, like 90% probably, mm. and especially in the global food system, we weren't aware of that. And of course, the biggest, clearest funder of ideas is the media. Right. And so in the mainstream media, we know that, but we need to be aware that even in the social media, the things that get out, the things that get rated high on Google are the ones where people can afford people constantly making sure that they move up. Mm -hmm. So we're now swimming in a field where our information, our ideas, our picture, is essentially a question of money. Right. Well, so, even seeing this, these false yeah. narratives that are circulating around yeah. here in Australia, the bushfires being caused by arson. Yeah. You know, just these, and they're funded um, to get the attention away from the government, to get attention away from climate change and the, the hot, dry conditions of the country. You're right. It's it's these stories of fear that are that are breeding more insecurity, that are breeding more scarcity, that are breeding more sadness and separation and, and disconnection and fear that causes people to react from a place of, you know, it's like our, our home, our very planet is threatened and so people are in such a fear state. Yeah, so the fear state also, you know, comes with that dependence mm -hmm. on the job and in the city. Right. So what we're saying is that right under our nose there is a paradigm there is a world view, there is an agenda that could start reversing things in a systemic way and immediately. Right under our nose, that paradigm exists in the real world because it is about reconnection to one another and mm. to the natural world. Mm. It is about a type of re-indigenization that means starting to come together wherever we live, even in the city, it's happening. 
people are coming together to support each other and often to take action. And I am seeing around the world that the people who are doing that are by far the happiest, most energetic, and in many cases revitalized. Mm. Even here in Australia, I've been visiting some communities and you know, with tears in their eyes, they've said that having this group is what's made this all possible to keep mm. going. And so I think what we're talking about with this new paradigm is what I generally call localization, because it is about place-based, face-to-face, living reconnection. And so I'm seeing the hotbeds of localization are often places that have been started by people who have had some experience globally and who come to see through this narrative that we're being fed and to realize how incredibly important it is to have those real bonds and connections and connections not only to people but to all of life. <sighs> Thank you. Now we're going to go into a few more specific topics so I hope you stay with us as we talk more about how our food is grown, where it's grown, climate change, and a few other of these specialty issues. Thanks, Elena. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check out the next videos in this five-part series. You can find out more about Helena's work at localfutures.org. Be sure to subscribe to my channel for more epic videos and follow me. Just search Plastic Free Mermaid. Thanks.